So given what Robert said last night and uh, some of the other things we talked about to start things off, we wanted to, to focus part of this weekend's time on, on vocation and on faith integration and vocation. And before us is a group of really um, talented and experienced folks on Capitol Hill who are all believers and who are going to share some, some great stuff with us today. And to, to, to moderate the session, uh, John Cusey uh, is going to lead things off. John is um, the Director of Government Relations here at AEI and uh, is a really talented person who's been increasing our game and our impact on Capitol Hill with a great team of people. Uh, he has 15 years of political and uh, policy experience at the state, local, and federal levels. Um, he worked both in the executive and legislative branches of the federal government. Um, he has done work at the California State Assembly, focusing on education and budget issues. Uh, he worked as a, as a press secretary on the Hill, as an LD on the Hill, um, as someone who has been executive director uh, of actually the pro-life caucus on Capitol Hill, and uh, worked in the Bush administration at the Administration for Children and Families uh, in the United States Department of Health and Human Services. Uh, so John is going to be leading off our panel, introducing our, our team. Uh, welcome to you all. Thank you so much for making time to come over and be with us this morning. John Cusey. Thank you, Josh. You make it sound like I can't keep a job. <laughs> um, and I don't really get asked to moderate very often, uh, so hopefully you won't find out why uh, <laughs> by how I moderate this panel. Um, but the name of this panel is Public Policy Close-Up, Perspectives from the Hill. And we have a great group here. Um, and I've worked with all three of them at one point or another, probably uh, Catherine most, John second most, and Elise a little bit. Uh, so I'm glad we lined you up that way. Um, but one of the things that I love about working in public policy is that you find the most competent, most selfless uh, group of people that you're ever going to interact with. Um, it's a very high pressure situation, so you find out what people are made of, find out uh, what they actually believe when somebody is pushing them in the opposite direction. So that's one of the things that is the most rewarding about working in politics. Um, is the, the just high caliber, high integrity uh, people that you uh, end up being in a foxhole with or locking arms with um, and getting to know in that type of situation. So uh, we have a great panel of those uh, kinds of people here. So let me introduce them and then we'll get into the conversation. Um, we actually have a pretty good amount of time here. So we'll, we'll talk for a while up here and then we'll open it up uh, for Q&A. Uh, from you uh, to engage with this panel as well. So I'm going to start with Elise. Elise uh, Bauer Anderson is foreign policy director for Congressman Frank Wolf, uh, who is retiring this year. Um, she specializes in human rights and religious liberty issues. Uh, she's worked on Capitol Hill for over a decade in both press and policy, in personal offices and also uh, in a committee office. Um, she served as a presidential appointee at the State Department in the Bureau of Democracy, Human Rights, and Labor, and later as a speechwriter in the Office, of, uh, office to Monitor and Combat, combat Trafficking in Persons. Um, human, trafficking, human trafficking is, that's probably the issue where you and I overlapped or worked uh, on some stuff together. Uh, Catherine Haley, here to my right as policy advisor for education, workforce, welfare, and social issues for uh, Speaker of the House John Boehner. Um, she's responsible for developing policy and coordinating strategies for Republican members of Congress and their staff on behalf of the Speaker. She worked for Pete Hoekstra, Senator Don Nichols, Kay Bailey Hutchinson, and for the Senate Select Committee on Aging and the Subcommittee on Health uh, and the Ways and Means Committee. So you also can't keep a job. Um, <laughs> John Hart is the communications director for Senator Tom Coburn and co-author of two books, Breach of Trust, How Americans Failed Their Soldiers and Their Country, and also The Debt Bomb, A Bold Plan to Stop Washington from Bankrupting America. He has also worked for former U.S. Representative Steve Largent, uh, Jim DeMint. He also served as a contributing editor to Regeneration Quarterly, a magazine on faith and culture, and became one of the youngest winners of an Amy Foundation Writing Award for a column he wrote about Mother Teresa's speech at the 94 prayer breakfast. Um, by the way, 
it takes a lot of work to end up in any of these three positions. A lot of uh, effort, a lot of proving yourself. These are, all three of these positions are things that people, uh, a lot of people would love to have on Capitol Hill. And so these uh, three have kind of risen through the ranks uh, and landed in those positions of responsibility. So uh, why don't I just start out by opening it up for the general question of, so how did you get here? You, everyone comes from different backgrounds who ends up here. Everyone has a different path. What was your path? How did your faith uh, contribute to that? Um, why are we here? And we'll start, we'll go from next to me to the right. Okay. First of all, John and Josh and Meredith for inviting all of us to be here. It's an honor and privilege to see all of you as you guys are wrestling with your faith and vocation and politics and government and sort of just the future. Um, I always appreciate that question of why are you here. Um, I like to preface it often by saying when I was fifth grade, I knew exactly what I was going to be when I grew up, and it was going to be a surgeon. I was going to be a doctor. <laughs> and for the next probably 15 years, did everything that I could to equip myself to be a really great doctor. So being a patient advocate, uh, spending times in hospitals, shadowing, doing research, being pre-med in college. Um, and when I graduated, thought to myself, well, my life is going to be charted out for me for the rest of my, for the next 30 years. It'd probably be helpful if I could dig in a little bit deeper into my faith. So I came to DC to do a fellows program where I did cancer research, but I also took seminary classes and engaged um, just what it looked like to be sort of in that servant leader role. And, um, but was very, very set on being a doctor. So continued to proceed, did some more research, took the MCATs, started applying. And then I did what a lot of my friends did, which was either intern or work on Capitol Hill because that looked fun. Um, <laughs> My life was going to be pretty set in stone for the next 30 years and pretty hard and pretty rigorous. But I also knew that policy drove health care, and I couldn't tell you the difference between Medicare and Medicaid. So for the next year, I thought this could be really fun. It could be sort of differentiate myself from my peers. Um, but the Lord had something very different in store. So the year of 2002 was a year of stripping away every sort of accolade, idol, Thing that I clung to, anything that I sort of like, this is my identity, he took all of that away. And what he left me was, do you really trust me? And um, through lots of prayer, um, sort of, yeah, I do, heard his voice. I know that's kind of random. Sometimes you don't really, in the cloud of all, all these things that we do, um, really heard his voice and said, this isn't what I have for you, I mean, re referring to the medical school. And I was like, are you kidding? I've spent countless hours. I took organic chemistry. I took <laughs> physics. I took like microbiology and you're not gonna let me go? I mean, really, okay. Um, and then the men member for whom I was interning lost his reelection. So I had nothing. I mean, talk about not knowing what was gonna come next. Um, but that was over almost 12 years ago, and I've been on Capitol Hill for the last 12 years. And what I've seen, sort of doing a lot of reflecting, especially over this last year, is that God can take the secret desires of your heart and can weave them and create a story in a way that you probably never conceive. Um, so instead of actually healing and interacting with patients, I get to be a patient advocate in the sense and work on issues like global health, where a month ago was in Tanzania and saw people that were literally had a death sentence, but 10 years ago, through the help of the generosity of the American people, have grants through PEPFAR, um, which is an HIV AIDS related program, um, that people can live with HIV, provide for their kids. You have a whole new generation now of kids who have parents, which means they might have a hope and they might have a future. Instead of being in sort of a destitute situation, you now see the dead now living. So I think very much that I am where I am because I've let God lead me. Um, it is a humbling place working on Capitol Hill. It is a place where your patience is tried every moment of every day. And the moment you think you have a grasp and you hold it really, really tight, the winds change. And it's 
a whole new path. So um, if it was up to me, I probably wouldn't be doing what I am doing. But where I am, I think, is exactly what I'm supposed to be doing. So um, I'll leave it at that. We're, we're thankful that that worked out that way. <laughs> By the way, that's a, that was a good, for us, a good change in your direction, <laughs> John. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, uh, Josh and John and everyone at AEI for organizing this. And uh, it's an honor to be here. And, you know, I, I remember very clearly uh, this phase of life where you're either in college or you're out of college and thinking through what you're going to do. And I would just say this, you know, the simple answer for me of why I'm here is when I was in high school, I discovered I had a passion for writing and for communicating and for putting words and ideas on, on paper and organizing those. It, it, it reminds me of the line in Chariots of Fire where the runner said, you know, when I run, I feel God's pleasure. Well, for me, when I write, I feel God's pleasure. And that's been a, a really a core part of who I am since I was in high school. So I started to write columns in my high school paper, and uh, I did that in college. I've, I actually just saw a friend at K-State. I was an undergraduate there, Travis, and uh, he remembers, you know, me from those days when I was a columnist. And uh, that was back when I had all the answers, when I was a college columnist. <laughs> and, uh, and I've kind of learned over the years I don't. But, um, but what I've tried to do is just be a faithful steward of my talents and my gifts. And, and, I've, and I felt like God has blessed that, and I've been blessed immensely. Um, you know, Senator Coburn, as, you, as a lot of you probably know, is retiring at the end of the year, and he was term limited. So he, so I knew the clock was ticking. He was going to leave in 2016, but he has a, he has a recurrence of cancer, so he's leaving a couple of years early. Uh, and it's just been, it's been an amazing ride and privilege to be with him. Um, so a little more of how I, of how I got here. So I was at college at K State, was a columnist, was a writer, and I knew that I didn't want to uh, go into law. Uh, so I went to gr grad school for journalism, went to K KU, and then came up to D.C. first in 93 as an intern. So 1993 was before the first Republican Revolution. Um, so I've seen a couple of Republican Revolutions. Um, and the well, current one's still ongoing. But um, uh, then I came back in 1997. And a fun, a fun story is I wanted to work for Senator Brownback, who was from Kansas. So, uh, so I went in and, and uh, wanted to get a meeting. And I just sat in the lobby. <laughs> for about two hours. <laughs> I was so determined that it was what I was supposed to do. And so the guy who I finally met with was the legislative director, and his name happens to be Paul Ryan, who later became the VP candidate. So Paul Ryan was my first supervisor. So I joke that my, my ambition is to begin and end my Capitol Hill career as Paul Ryan's intern. <laughs> um, so that's, that's a little of, of where I got it. But you know, one, one thought that I, and I, I imagine we'll talk about this a lot today, is um, there are a lot of different ideas of what, what faith in politics is and isn't. And I, th I think what it is, in just a sentence, is an integrated way of incorporating your faith in everything you do. Mm -hmm. So faith in politics is the same as faith in business, as faith in cutting your grass or, or taking care of your, your kids, um, all the responsibilities of life. And so there are unique challenges, obviously, which I th I'm sure we'll talk about in some depth. But... Um, it's not, faith in politics is not having the, quote, Christian agenda or a political philosophy. It's about figuring out what is, what is God trying to do in my life? How can I be faithful with what I've been given and to listen to the Holy Spirit? Um, and that's, that's a little of my, my journey. Well, I just want to echo Catherine and uh, John and thanking you all for the invitation to be here today. And I've actually known both of them for years, but didn't know some of their accomplishments until John read their bios. So <laughs> um, I guess, I, I, so I work for Congressman Frank Wolf, and I actually started in Washington as an intern in his office. My journey was a little bit different in the sense that I'm a native of this area. And so I grew up in the Northern Virginia suburbs. So Washington wasn't necessarily just a, um, something that I viewed from afar, kind of a, a Hollywood 
uh, movie novel informed notion. It was my own backyard and my father had been in politics and so there was a lot about Washington that was familiar. I wouldn't say that I knew for sure I wanted to go into politics per se, but my experience up to that point had been largely domestic in nature, uh, domestic politics that is. And so when I interned for Congressman Wolf the summer before my junior and senior year, uh, or between rather my junior and senior year in college, uh, it was at the height of a very robust debate in Congress surrounding whether the U.S. should grant China most favored nation trading status. And uh, Congressman Wolf was kind of leading the charge in opposition to that, um, uh, that favored nation trading status. Ultimately, we were unsuccessful, but even as an intern in the office, I was kind of exposed to this world of um, international human rights and religious freedom. That was largely what was motivating his opposition, given some of the human rights issues in China and Tibet and with the house church. And um, I saw through his kind of advocacy efforts, really um, unique and kind of strange bedfellow coalitions that uh, tended to evolve around this issue. And so you had uh, Nancy Pelosi and Frank Wolf in a room strategizing together. And, and for those of you who don't aren't familiar with my boss, I would characterize him as a conservative Republican and, um, and characterize Ms. Pelosi however you'd like. But um, <laughs> and Not then, a conservative Republican. <laughs> Uh, you had, you know, the Richard Gears of the world who championed the Tibet issue and the Southern Baptists. You had the labor unions and the Catholic Church. And so it was, you know, on domestic issues, you would never find these folks on the same page. But on this particular uh, fight, you, you found them in the same room strategizing and finding common cause. And it was a really kind of intriguing thing to behold. And it also exposed me to... Um, the plight of persecuted people abroad in a way that I hadn't uh, to date been exposed to. And so I think in hindsight, and I, I certainly didn't recognize it at the time, but it both whet my appetite and also was probably the beginning of a calling, although it was a very circuitous route, not quite as circuitous as, as Catherine. I wasn't headed to medical school. I've always been terrible at math and science, but, <laughs> um, but it, it definitely kind of planted those seeds of interest in um, in that arena. And so rather than belaboring kind of the route that ultimately brought me back to um, this current position, I'd say that in terms of how my faith has informed my current work, in a lot of respects, my faith has been strengthened by my current work, my exposure um, in this job and in some previous jobs, but, but notably in this position, um, to men and women of faith who are really giants in every way and I mean I'm, I'm speaking largely about the persecuted church but certainly we do work with um, people who are oppressed and persecuted for following the dictates of their conscience whether that's a Tibetan Buddhist or a Baha'i in Iran or um, a Uyghur Muslim in in China so it's not um, exclusive to any one faith it's a, it's a larger belief in the importance of religious freedom but um, all that to say, my exposure to these men and women and they, their willingness to truly count the cost in a way that a lot of American Christians haven't had to do to date um, has undergirded my faith, strengthened my faith, and kind of propelled me in this work in a way that I never really could have anticipated. There are um, a lot of people of faith come to Washington, D.C. to work um, and they consider their job as a Christian to then start Bible studies, tell people about God, try to uh, convert or share uh, with uh, people, and don't really think through a lot about how their faith impacts their job, their vocation, their day-to-day -day work on transportation policy, or something that sounds very uh, far away from uh, from what's talked about in the scriptures. How do you, how do you approach your vocation as a, as a Christian in the political sphere with all the pressures that are there? How do you integrate your faith into your everyday um, work? And is it, do you do things differently uh, as a Christian in those day-to-day uh, facing those day-to-day -day struggles than you would if you were not. 
Um, and is it, do you think it's harder to be a Christian on the Hill than if, you're, than if you don't have those types of um, beliefs and values? Uh, so I'll throw that to all three of you as well. I'll start first. <laughs> um, how does my faith inform what I do? Um, I think to begin with, working on Capitol Hill, many people come to Washington, I think, in pursuit of power or to be near power. And, um, and it's alluring and it's exciting. And the people you get to interact with, whether it's people that come into you, that you meet with, or the members of Congress with whom you serve, or the committees, or the policies, just the different things that we get to do impact every American. And that's exciting. Um, as far as my faith and how it informs me working in this particular environment, what I have learned is that um, this job is not about me at all. And when I think that it has anything to do with me, um, I'm quickly flat-footed, out of step, and sort of caught oftentimes sort of in a difficult situation. Um, that's not to say that we aren't challenged anyway, but I'd say that, and I apologize for sort of muddling over my words, but my faith informs me in that I approach every day is I'm here to serve. I'm here to serve my colleagues. I'm here to serve my boss. I'm here to serve the other members of Congress and their team and their staffs, um, the constituents that elected our bosses. And when I forget that, then I know that what I'm doing here is not sort of, in, sort of, incongru it's incongruent to sort of my place here. Um, I have found there are many people that sort of say that they're a Christian, but the way they live out their lives on Capitol Hill, um, I think, contradict their faith. And um, when Christians say, I am a Christian and I'm in politics, sometimes I feel like you're held to a double standard. Um, people are quick to judge when you fall short. There's not necessarily a lot of grace. Um, so sometimes I feel like what, the way I approach my job um, and the teams and the people with whom I work is that um, sometimes the actions speak louder than words. So it's listening and being compassionate and being patient. Um, people are quick to use pretty cutting words um, and tear people apart and they can be angry and judgmental. And so it's taking all of those things and sort of approaching them, um, waiting to speak being sort of slow to speak as scripture calls us to do and quick to listen um, and also to show compassion and love. Um, people fall a lot and um, it's really important to sort of stand by your brother or sister. So I'll leave that. Great. Well, that's a great question. Um, John in his question, I think, began to touch on something that's really important where he you know, referenced transportation policy. And I think what he's getting at is that most, the reality is most of what we do on the Hill is very mundane and tedious. In other words, a lot of the issues we, we deal with um, are not overtly spiritual, so to speak, okay? So some of us have portfolios that, are, that look much more, quote, Christian, whether it's dealing with life, pro-life issues, or at least, you know, gets to deal with a lot of, you know, issues of religious persecution. So there are the things that get talked about in a spiritual context, but I think one of the first, so let me give kind of a theoretical and a practical answer here. So theoretical would be to reject the false dichotomy between what is spiritual and secular. So we often, again, think of the, the quote, Christian issues. Well, if you're doing transportation policy or if you're a staffer in our office who's working on the VA, I can tell you what you're doing on the VA is profoundly spiritual, where you're trying to solve a problem and you're trying to faithfully execute your, your responsibilities in serving an elected member of Congress. So most, most of the jobs on the Hill, whether they're a policy job or even a press job, uh, don't have a Christian gloss to them, so to speak, but they are very, very spiritual. And again, it's how, and that's really how Jesus, um, I think, wants us to think. Uh, and, and, it's, and, and thinking of things in a Christian set of issues is really one of the ways the enemy I think tends to co-opt and divide us. 
C.S. Lewis talked a lot about Christian sex and how when, when you elevate a certain set of issues, you become one part claiming to represent the whole. And, and that's, a, that's a dangerous road to walk down. Um, so I think, and then some of the practical things, um, I think loving your enemies is really, really important. Um, reaching out to the other. Um, uh, there's a guy, Miroslav Wolf, uh, that I got to know in the Balkans. I spent a, a few months over there. He wrote a book called, called Exclusion and Embrace. And the point of it is simply that um, if, you wanna, if you really want to have an impact in politics and in, in public policy, you have to figure out how to love the other. So who is the other? Well, the other, if you're Frank Wolf, it's Nancy Pelosi, or it's Tony Hall, and Frank Wolf and Tony Hall are close friends. So, and I've tried to build relationships with people who are Democrats. There's a good, a good friend who may be here, Max Finberg. Um, I meet with him every Friday. He's a liberal Democrat. If he and I were in office, we'd vote opposite. Uh, but we both agree that Jesus has a heart for the poor. He has a heart for justice. And uh, we're not so arrogant as to think our political philosophies are the end-all, be-all. Um, so, so I think the way I try to integrate that is, is to have those relationships. So when I'm communicating, we're in a pitch battle over an issue, and there's a lot of pitch battles, and you know, we all get carried away uh, in, our, in our positions, that knowing that I have to look a liberal Democrat in the face every week, look him in the eye, and, and judge my own motivations, that is a very liberating, freeing relationship to have. And, and my boss has a much more public relationship, but it's mostly private with the president. So Coburn and Obama are good friends. And we get, we get criticized all the time. Why, you know, why is your boss hugging President Obama? And his answer is, what better way to influence someone than to love them? <clears throat> and what a great example that is. And, and that, to me, represents a great way to integrate faith and politics. It's being countercultural. It's being a dissident. It's not conforming to the political culture in Washington. Can I follow up on that and ask, um, so you, that, and that's, uh, I think that false dichotomy between the, the secular and the spiritual is uh, something that's done a lot of damage, especially to evangelicals, which I am one. Um, Catholics don't seem to make that same uh, division, uh, at least uh, in, in the higher levels. But you, it's very clear that God cares about how we treat each other and how we um, interact with our enemies uh, and or opponents. It's very clear that he, um, or, so let me ask, do, do you think, think, and, he, and it's very clear he cares about our motivations and what is in our hearts. Do you think he also, on that next level, cares about the outcome of a transportation policy debate or a health policy debate? Do you think there, that God cares about the outcome of these policy fights? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> no, and I think he, uh, I, th I think, yeah, he cares about the outcome. These are, uh, he cares about the process and the outcome, I think is the answer. He judges the motivations and thoughts of the heart. But yes, I think, I think God is a God of order. You know, it, it, he created the universe. And I think we all, all of us up here obviously believe that very deeply. And that has profound implications on how we think about politics because, uh, you know, one of the great sins in politics is idolatry. You know, it's worshiping the same false god from different sides of the altar, whether it's liberal or Democrat. And uh, so I think, but I think he does care about the outcome. Um, he wants to see a, a, a political environment that's ordered, that blesses the poor, that cares for the widow and the orphan. And, you know, I, you know, as a conservative, I think most, a lot of that means getting the federal government out of the way and letting, I mean, you know the speech, but, um, but I think he does, I think he cares about both the outcome and, and the process. And, and again, when you, when you love, loving your enemies is not, it's really loving and embracing them, not just tolerating them. But that doesn't mean the disagreements are not real and, and that they're not consequential. So that's the other, that's the other flip side. You don't want to go down that road either. Um, a lot that has been said, and I'll maybe piggyback on a couple of things. Um, Catherine mentioned uh, some of the 
I guess, well, both Catherine and John, some of the idols of this city. And I think, you know, every, every country, every society, every city has its idols. In Washington, it tends to be uh, access to power, influence, etc. cetera. Um, and uh, I think recognizing that as a Christian, if you choose to come to Washington, is critical because it has vast implications on your own um, understanding of identity. I remember years ago um, when Speaker Gingrich uh, one day was speaker and the next day was not, and I, I saw him going down the escalator into the Capitol South Metro stop and thought how quickly things can change in this city, that at one point you're at the kind of pinnacle of power, and obviously we've seen that played out on the national scale just this week, um, and then overnight things can change, and um, you quickly learn who your true friends are and who were simply um, people that wanted access for politically expedient reasons, etc. And I think that in that space where um, people put so much weight on, you know, the title on your card and what that represents, that there's an opportunity for people of faith, for Christians specifically, to form true relationships that value not the position but the individual. Um, so that's that's one thought about just uh, the kind of idols of Washington and how to live a bit differently in that sphere. Um, do I do things differently as a Christian? I'd like to think so. It's not always the case. I mean, it's difficult to be in a pitched argument with someone and maintain a sense of graciousness with them and not to be tempted to hang up the phone and devolve into gossip with a coworker about, can you believe so-and-so said this, or to kind of conspire. And uh, so it, it is a, a constant, I mean, I don't wanna um, give the impression that we kind of live in these, you know, ivory. <laughs> um, it, it's, it's a challenge and there is a higher standard if you're a professing Christian. So I think that that's a, um, makes it all the more critical that you are in true community with other believers that can both hold you accountable, but also encourage you. Um, you know, at different points in my own kind of professional journey right now, I've had the opportunity to work on issues that could be considered more spiritual, but that's not always been the case. Did I, when I was a legislative correspondent writing, you know, hundreds of letters to constituents on a daily basis, did I think that that was, you know, uh, my ultimate calling in life? No. Um, but I had a bit more time then to invest relationally with people in my office and to perhaps start Bible studies. And so I think there's different seasons for what that calling can, can look like. Um, yeah, I'll leave it there. Elise, uh, your comments reminded me of this really awful Capitol Hill habit, which is when you're talking to somebody at an event, there, it's like I'm talking to Catherine. <laughs> Hello, Catherine. And you're always looking over your sho their, her shoulder to see which more important person might be walking into the room <laughs> that you might have to dismiss <laughs> from this less important person to like move on to the next thing. And it, it's a, you see it happen. You go to these events and it's, people are constantly figuring out who, how they can kind of jump up uh, in their own careers, but even just in a conversation, oh, that person's more important. I need to go move to them instead of you're here in front of me, I actually want to engage with you uh, meaningfully. Anyway, um, all of us are a little older than when we first got here. Um, and we certainly had a lot of ideas when we first arrived uh, in this town or uh, at least in this uh, work space. Um, and we have different ideas now. So I'm curious how that has uh, changed over time and specifically the things that you thought when you first got here that were wrong, that you determined. Um, you know, that I came in with a certain set of ideas and over time I realized, no, that was wrong and I needed to adjust to something else. So I would let's start with John on this one okay. so we don't, uh, so we actually okay. give Catherine a minute. <laughs> Oh gosh, um, I'm, I'm trying to. Th I, I don't know that I would say that there was something I thought and I was totally wrong, 
about what I initially had an expectation of. But I can tell you there's a lot of areas where I didn't understand the magnitude of certain dynamics and tensions. I think one, one that jumps out is, you know, if when I was 21, if, if someone would have said, do you think politics will transform culture? I would say no. But in my heart, I thought that coming to Washington, working for a Christian, being a good Christian in politics could transform and renew culture more than I would have admitted. I would say now, having been in this realm for over 20 years, 20 years or so, I would tell you that um, you can transform the culture within Washington, but D.C. itself is not nearly as equipped to be an agent of cultural transformation as universities, as media, as academia, as the arts. Uh, so we all have a good friend, Mark Rogers, and Bill Wichterman, and the, one of their lines is, you know, politics is downstream from culture. So I, would, I think that's a great caution and, and a wise observation. And so um, uh, I think bringing about a culture that values truth, and again, and the whole, all the rule of law discussion we have up here is really a discussion about truth. Is there other things transcendent beyond just government? You know, are we gonna have the rule of law or the rule of rulers? And our, our, we were founded based on certain inalienable rights that came from a creator. So there are things we can do from the quote, the top to change that. But the more profound implication I think is, is more at the university level and the, and the broader culture. So I think that's, that's one, again, I wouldn't say I would have given the wrong answer, but my understanding of that is much better I think than it was when I came up here. I would echo what what John is saying, just recognizing kind of the limits of what can be accomplished in Washington. That being said, um, you know, I came of age, if you can call it that, during the kind of height of the Christian right, the Christian coalitions, focus on the family, et cetera, and was very much on a family level engaged in that sphere. And um, I think that the pendulum while I'm not technically a millennial, I missed it by a few years, but my sense is from folks your age and your peers, although if you're here, you obviously think that there's a valid role for public policy and government, but my sense is that the pendulum has kind of swung the other direction and that um, for, say, a young pro-life Christian who may have 20 years ago thought the way I can make the biggest impact is to come to Washington and head up the pro-life caucus or work at the national right to life or you know etc cetera, etc cetera, that now the inclination may be more i'm going to pursue a counseling degree and work at a local crisis pregnancy center and i don't know that the two are mutually exclusive but i think as as john indicated that all of these spheres are um, critically important and that whether it's in the public policy realm or the broader kind of cultural um you know the film the arts the uh, journalism, uh, academia, that all of these areas, there it's not one versus the other, um, that it's critically important for people of faith to be engaged in each of those spheres. And um, to another kind of parallel issue, the, the, the marriage issue, I think you've seen in that realm um, laws that were passed that supported a certain position where the culture was headed in a very different direction. And if you look at kind of shifts in public opinion on that issue, regardless of where you stand on it, one of the defining moments was the advent of Will and Grace. So here you had a hugely popular television show that was one of what would ultimately be many um, Hollywood representations of sexuality and um, that has been, uh, I would argue, really significant in kind of shifting public opinion over a fairly dramatic um, uh, period of time in a, in a different direction. So I think we need to occupy all of those spaces as believers, and, and I, I too would say that after having been here for some time, I think I recognize the limits of what can be accomplished in Washington, although I still think that it's an important place for believers to, to um, be. Uh, and then I guess on a more, uh, on less the 10,000 foot view and more kind of practical level, um, 
I don't know that I had great boundaries when I arrived in Washington, and by that I mean, you know, it was pre-iPhones, but I would have slept with, you know, <laughs> my iPhone by my, uh, or Blackberry by my ear and been the first to answer if a boss emailed with a question and be immediately accessible and stay in the office even if I didn't necessarily have anything to do just to kind of give the impression that I was available and a hard worker and, um, you know, I, I say that somewhat tongue in cheek, but there's a lot of people that do that when they first come here and then continue to do that and then burn out. And so I think it's just as important to set those boundaries early on. There's always going to be someone who can stay up later, can work longer for less, um, but they will burn out. <laughs> so if you choose to come here, you know, recognizing that your work isn't the whole of your life, it is not the whole of your identity, and that you're not ultimately going to be, I don't, in my view, penalized by not being always at the beck and call of your boss, whoever that is. Um, and that in a lot of respects, I think bosses sometimes respect a certain uh, willingness to say, you know, after this hour, I probably am not going to be available. That's not to say that I'm not going to work with excellence from this time to this time. But, um, and of course, there are exceptions to that. But uh, just as a general rule, uh, having some boundaries with work, I think, is important. So I think Elise and John covered most everything, I'd probably say, um, and certainly very eloquently. I think the other thing, not so much learned or changed, but um, at any given moment, where we are can change in an instant. So I sort of opened with, OK, aha, I'm supposed to stay on Capitol Hill, and then the member for whom I was interning lost his reelection. Um, similarly. I think individuals come to the Hill and just sort of have this expectation that I will just have this job. Um, whether you're on Capitol Hill or in an executive branch or you're working for a president, um, there will come a time where that position uh, might not exist for you. And so having an openness and being prepared and having close relationships, I think, are very, very important, not only um, for that moment when you are in a difficult time. So I have some friends who um, have lost jobs because of elections or um, bosses have been term limited as chairman or ranking members of committees or they work for the executive branch um, and we're looking for jobs. And it was a, it's a tremendously humbling time to see, in a sense, be at the mercy of others and their compassion and their help. Um, so. I guess my advice or something that I've learned along the way is don't take the opportunities that I have now for granted. So use those, the opportunities that I have to build and invest in others. So reaching back and pulling others along, helping develop their character and their professionalism on Capitol Hill or in the executive branch, lend um, an ear, provide counseling, encourage, affirm, uh, speak truth into individuals' lives, but also build networks for yourselves so that there may be a time where you two might need help along the way. Um, that's just something that I don't, I think I took that opportunity for granted earlier in my professional career and sort of see the value in it now um, as I've walked alongside um, a lot of friends who've been in difficult situations, but also me trying to parse out what it is I'm supposed to do. So. I guess to build on what Elise said, community is absolutely invaluable. Um, and don't forget that. Really, in any career that you guys choose and pursue, um, the value of relationship is what helps keep you grounded. It reminds you of who you are. Um, and uh, I think holds you account um, regardless of wherever you choose to have influence. How many of the people in this room are interested in getting involved uh, at some point in their careers in public policy or politics by a show of hands? Okay, so not, I don't know, what was that, about half, maybe a little over half? Um, 
and get your questions ready because I'm about to turn to you. So make sure you're ready to go here. It's always the first question that's the toughest. But uh, both Catherine and Elise kind of uh, gave advice on um, like if you're thinking of getting involved in this particular vocation, this particular calling. Um, but I want to just kind of throw that more explicit uh, question out. I don't, not everybody has to answer it, but is it, do you have pieces of advice that you would give somebody starting out in this field? Yeah, I'll start. Uh, number one, I would say be willing to do anything. Uh, when, I, when I came up here, again, I was, I, my first internship was 1993 for Congresswoman Jan Myers, the House Small Business Committee, when I was an undergraduate student. And I didn't, then I came back, it was several years later, 1997, and when I came back, I had a master's degree in journalism. I thought, oh, I have a master's degree. And, and then I realized if I, if I, and through the wise of counsel of others, just get, take whatever you can get. <laughs> so I got an internship with Sam Brownback, and then Paul Ryan was my supervisor, and then from there, uh, I heard about a guy named Tom Coburn, this you know, bomb thrower in the house who seemed like a lot of fun. He was hiring a uh, legislative assistant deputy press secretary. So I was, so in, in, I think the, the point of that is I was willing to take and do a job that I felt like I was overqualified for. And you will find a lot of people on the Hill who think they're overqualified. And I could tell you that the, the, the more you dis, disabuse yourself of that notion, the better off you're going to be. And be a servant. Just go and do, serve your, serve your colleagues especially. Find out what are the jobs that people don't like to do in the office and go do those and do them really well. And you'll find that you'll be able to move into areas you didn't even anticipate. You'll be asked to take on more responsibility uh, than when you came. So that's one very practical. I'll have to agree with that. I think that from intern to staff assistant, there's always somebody with a Harvard Law degree who's perfectly willing to do that job for free. <laughs> so you always have that type of uh, very overqualified uh, group of people that are willing to do it for cheap. Uh, anyone else on that question? I think I'll, I, I meet with um, students, individuals that are about to graduate, individuals that are in a career change. Um, you don't have to know everything in which you believe. However, it is helpful to have a sense of at least basic principles. Um, I remember meeting with a young woman and uh, she was originally from California and she just was excited. She was graduating with a communications degree and she said, yeah, I just, and I have, obviously I work for the speaker. He's a Republican and um, he holds certain values and principles. And she's like, I just would love a job. And I started finding out a little bit about her interests and from where she, a uh, little bit about where she's from and her experiences. And so I started rattling off different members based on her interests and her passions. And she's like, absolutely, that sounds great. Please I, you know, provide the context and um, I'll follow up with them with informational interviews. And I said, I, I probably should have asked this at the beginning, but where do you stand politically? Like, what are your interests, like, from a political standpoint? And she's like, well, actually, I think I'm a Democrat. Like, I think I align in the sort of Democrat line of thinking and sort of articulated a few other points. And I was like, well, me introducing you to all these other individuals probably won't necessarily be helpful in your pursuit of a career on Capitol Hill. Um, I'm gonna have to pause for a while and sort of come up with some other names. And she's like, yeah, but it's just a job. Um, I, I'm sure I could do it anyway. And my, what I have learned, certainly I'm working for many different types of members of Congress who have all Republicans, but all approach their sort of Republican philosophy in different ways, is that you will be an extension of your boss. And if you disagree on almost everything from your boss, your job is going to be very, very hard. Uh, because you represent them in communication with constituents and the letters that you write and the policy that you advocate, the policy recommendations that you make, the press statements that you write, everything you do re reflects your boss. And at no point, it's your own position. And it, it can be a very difficult tension for staff when they work for a member with whom they disagree on almost everything. Um, 
It is, I think, the rare exception where individuals can jump from party to party. There are staffers that have that niche expertise, um, but it is more rare than um, sort of the reality. Um, so I think have a sense, but also have an openness uh, and sort of a spirit, a teachable spirit, because you will learn literally new things every single day. Anytime that I think I'm like, okay, I, I know K-12 education. I know the implications of it. I get the policy. I get the institutional side. I get all the different players. I will learn something new every day. And um, having that humility and sort of ex sort of that grace to sort of learn and be corrected, not corrected like you are wrong and you need to go sit in a corner, but no, that is not correct. We have, um, we have a different standard, standard operating procedure in our office. Take that and apply it and do it better the next time. Um, I'll give one more anecdote. We had an intern several years ago. It was in a different office and um, sort of this idea of like she was pursuing a master's degree in intelligence and my boss at the time was chairman of the intelligence committee and she thought by interning in our office that she would have the opportunity to travel with my boss to global hotspots in the world. Um, we ourselves didn't get to go travel to global hotspots. None of us had security clearance. We didn't get to work on the policy. There was this big black room box in the Capitol with where he um, went to go hide at different times and he was unreachable. Um, but she really thought that that's what she was going to do by interning with us. And no, she got to sort mail, she got to write um, uh, constituent mail when we provided constructed feedback. She would say, no, you're wrong. This is not the correct way to write a letter. And we're like, this is how we write letters. Um, and then I think the kicker, we, our office didn't really ever fire interns, but we fired this one. Um, she sat down the scheduler and told the scheduler that the way she had organized the office and was advising and preparing our member of Congress in his very chaotic schedule was completely wrong that she did not have the best strategies in place and that there are things that she observed that our scheduler could do in a better way to ensure that our congressman was better prepared. Um, needless to say, I think she packed her bags at the end of the day, if that. Um, but there is a system and in in sort of uh, strategies where like the office functions in a particular way. And sometimes it can be really hard to kind of get in sync with that. But again, have an openness and a teachable spirit because many of us, the way we advise, whether it's an intern or a staff assistant, a legislative correspondent or an LA or legislative assistant or anybody in the office, there are structures and procedures that have been put in place because of the lessons that have been learned um, over the years. So. Uh, go in with an openness. I think my writing style changes every single time I work for a different member because you become that voice of that particular member of whom you serve. So um, lots of anecdotes and stuff, but kind of building on what you guys said. Just, just briefly, yeah, I 100% echo everything that John and Catherine have said and would, would just briefly add that, you know, each individual office is its own kind of fiefdom and so what you think you've learned in you know your government 101 or 201 or whatever class about how a bill becomes a law or whatever probably doesn't apply so spending those early months if you work on Capitol Hill and this is specific to Capitol Hill but spending those early months really just observing the kind of um, machinations of that particular office and the the authority structures and what needs to be signed off on and what doesn't need to be signed off on and um, you know how portfolios are divided and why those are critical things that someone isn't going to give you in an employee handbook but you you need to learn them and so um, just being quick to observe as opposed to quick to to speak um, or to offer feedback I think in the early days is important and then I would also just add to that as you're embarking on a job search um, at some point that the more broad you can keep your focus the better um, I often meet with students who are on the cusp of graduating and are deeply passionate about say human trafficking and they basically say I want to work at IJM or um, in the trafficking office at the State Department or be a single focused LA that handles human trafficking. Well, you've 
basically just listed like a handful of jobs <laughs> in a city with thousands of jobs and rarely are those going to be available um, right out of the gate. And so just to, it's, it's good to know what you're passionate about and what you ultimately might want to end up working on, but recognizing that those entry level positions are usually how you're going to have to kind of get your feet wet and that for better or worse, the Hill in particular tends to be a place where people want you to kind of pay your dues. And so you can have a, a master's or even a PhD in something that would kind of infinitely qualify you from an intellectual perspective, but if you don't know what a dear colleague is or you don't know what the cloakroom is, that's going to be to your disadvantage. So just being willing to kind of take those um, entry level positions, even if they're outside of the scope of what you ultimately want to be doing, but viewing that as a, a stepping stone to those positions, I think is, is helpful as you uh, look after college. I would always tell my entry level interns or staff that it was their duty to eavesdrop on everything. Pay attention to everything that's going on. Listen to phone conversations the whole time. Um, I guess it's not eavesdropping if you're telling them to do it, but anyway. Listening. All right, uh, questions. And it, uh, as I call on you, if you could identify, uh, if you're in school, what school uh, you're with, at, so that if you're from California, I can cheer from it for you. Okay, here. Uh, I guess we have microphones making their way to you. Hi, I'm Kayla Marish from Grove City College, and um, several of you had mentioned the importance of balance and boundaries in um, your work, and so I wondered if you could speak to how to balance work and family life hmm. specifically. I don't have a family, but. <laughs> do, you want me to, do you want me to start? Sure, yeah. Well, we'll, no, we'll, we'll have an interesting <laughs> answer, I'm sure. Well, I have four kids. <laughs> I have a, uh, my wife is, is uh, homeschooling our four, and she is brilliant. She's a uh, MIT grad, Columbia law grad, and we're homeschooling now. She works part, she actually is the executive director of Faith and Law, which is about 10 or sometimes 20 hours a week, but um, so I, I think the, the answer, frankly, is you just have to make a decision about what you really value, and our culture teaches people they can have everything, and that is a lie. Okay, so I think you have to set priorities and realize at you know, 20, 30 years, do you want to look back and, reg and regret not spending more time at work or not spending more time with your kids? And I I'll tell you that I made a decision that I will not look back and miss my kids' childhood, ch childhoods. So practically what that means is unless I have to be at the office for a very particular reason, I will leave as often as I can at 545 and I still get home at seven. So it's, a, I mean, it's a stretch. Um, and, but days, days where, where it's more flexible, I try to get home earlier just to, to be around for dinner. And I'm a night owl, so I can stay up and write. I do that a lot. And, I, and luckily in our, in our particular office, we have a very family friendly office. Not everybody has that, has that privilege. And Dr. Coburn is very family friendly. He doesn't expect people who have families to sit there and and as Elise kind of alluded to, there's a, there is a pressure on the Hill to just be at your desk doing something important. There's always gonna be a million things you could be doing that are quote important. And it's, it really is an issue of priorities. And you just have to decide what it is you value the most and, and just do it. And, and, and deal with the consequences of it because it doesn't always mean it's gonna work out, but. Um, so we have two children and almost three in about four weeks. Um, so I wish that I had a clear answer to your question. I think for me personally, it's a constant struggle. Um, and obviously what that means, and this is a whole books are written on this, but what that means for men and women, different things. Um, but I'd say there's a series of little decisions that we've made along the way that um, as John alluded to, reflect a certain set of priorities. So um, just by way of example, we, uh, when we were expecting our second, um, were living on the hill in a place that was not big enough for another child. And uh, number two was kind of a surprise. And we were like, where are we going to live? And <laughs> 
the houses that were cheaper were way further out of the city, um, but that also meant a longer commute time. And um, those, when you have kids that are going to sleep at, you know, 7 p.m., those are precious hours. And so we decided for this season that we wanted to try to stay in the city, if at all possible, even if that meant moving um, to perhaps a less desirable area, but still close to Capitol Hill. Um, so we ended up moving kind of east of the river over closer to Anacostia where we could get a little more house for our money but still um, you know have a commute that was basically 15 minutes and for now that's what works well for our family when school is an issue uh, I mean our oldest isn't even three yet so when school becomes an issue we're gonna have to obviously reevaluate what uh, where we live and what that looks like um, so you know it's it's i wish i said i had the kind of 10-year plan and this is what it looks like i don't um but at different points in in the process whether it was choosing where to live whether it was having a somewhat uncomfortable conversation with my boss about teleworking on fridays which is not you know a, a typical thing that people do on capitol hill but which they graciously agreed to recognizing that it was basically the worst kept secret that I wasn't actually working on Fridays with two kids under two. Um, I would be somewhat available on email if an emergency arose and then could catch up in the evenings after they went to bed. So, you know, I think it's, it's, a, it's a balance. It's a one that I do very imperfectly. And, um, you know, I'm not in the same position that you all are in, but my boss did announce that he's retiring at the end of this year. So we're embarking on another season of transition and what that will look like for our family in terms of work and how much time I'm in an office setting versus at home. You know, I'm not yet sure. Um, so just kind of prayerfully engaging in that conversation with your spouse. And it is critical to, I mean, not to get into a separate conversation about being unequally yoked, but I think having a spouse that, that you're on the same page with about these basic questions is obviously a, a huge part of the equation. So we're actually the marriage and family session is next. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Like, yeah. And I will have to say, uh, for me, after I had not seen my three children for two weeks because I was getting home after they went to bed and leaving before they woke up, I had to leave a job I loved and do something different. So sometimes it just doesn't work out um, and you have to make difficult decisions like that as well. Uh, next question, in the back here. Hi, my name is uh, Jose Socorro from ORU and I have like a twofold question. First question would be when you first came, uh, how was it in regards to finding that spiritual leader and role model like, like a minister? And second, could you share of one experience that uh, you learned or, or like a lesson in life about wisdom and how to do things from a situation working on the hill where it was like, I was reading this particular portion of the Bible and this situation played out and like, oh, that's what that means. Kind of like the aha moment. If you would mind sharing on that. Thank you. And don't feel like everybody has to answer every question if you don't want to. We won't put you on the spot, but anyone wanna take one or both of those? I'll try to tra tackle both. Um, probably, I wish I had had this advice earlier. I, I came to DC with a different goal in mind. I came to DC, I did research, I was sort of infused into a Christian community. So when I came to Capitol Hill, I wasn't necessarily looking for new friends and wasn't necessarily looking for a Bible study because I was already in one. Um, but what I have, in looking back over the last couple of years, um, Finding a church home wherever you guys go from here is critically important. And being involved um, in some way. Washington, D.C. has a ton of churches that are alive, that are feeding the soul and digging deep into scripture and challenging their parishioners to live out their faith in whatever they're calling. So if you come to Washington, there is lots of opportunity to get involved. Um, on Capitol Hill, there are, again, Bible study opportunities, um, individuals that come who are literally, their job is to minister to either Hill staff or members of Congress. And so you have those opportunities as well. There's also, each of us has been involved with an organization called Faith and Law, where we have reading groups and sort of debate, read, kind of break apart uh, different issues of the day and 
figure out how we can do our jobs better. So I think um, if you're coming to Washington, there's lots of opportunity to plug in and look for it and actively seek it. Um, uh, sort of as John mentioned earlier, sort of like eavesdrop and listen for cues because you never know what kind of conversation that you'll have that will lead then to either get involved with a group or to pursue mentors. Um, I think as far as sort of specific scripture coming alive, I feel like that happens most every day. Um, the last probably five and a half years working for the speaker, first in the minority, but then also in the majority, I have never prayed more out of desperation or been more faithfully in the word um, than in this job. I honestly cannot do my job without spending at a minimum five, 10, 15 minutes or even longer um, just having a, a, a time of prayer um, and just in reading of the scripture and figuring out, okay, Lord, show up today because I'm going to absolutely need you. Whether it's in a difficult conversation with a constituent, um, trying not to get in a screaming match with uh, an advocacy group organization that is, in my mind, pursuing the wrong strategy about the wrong policy <laughs> with the wrong goals. Um, uh, Who are you talking about? I don't know. <laughs> not AEI. AEI is amazing, always. Um, but I, I, honestly, like, my faith, uh, I think, has been deepened um, because every day I'm in a very humbling situation. So I can't speak to a specific moment right at this time, but there have been times when I'm like, I am so glad I had my devotion. I'm so glad that today I was 30 minutes late because what I did this morning at home had, will have, like, infinite... Um, application today so go over here in this side uh, oh uh, okay right here because there's already a microphone here I'm Mackenzie Lau from Bethel College and uh, kind of along the same lines of fellowship what do you say fellowship would look like um, not just on Sundays but in the workplace and do you notice other people standing out as Christians in the workplace and how do you notice them it's usually the snake handling, isn't that <laughs> the main thing? Or the or being on the corner, preaching. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah I'll I'll take that. I, in terms of um, more in terms of community, uh, you know, I would I would encourage you to, in in the workplace, you know, find a few like-minded people um, who don't have to be on this of the same party necessarily, but who are trying to think and approach issues in a way that God has described, whether, again, it's priorities about the poor, justice, and the inner life of the motivations. You know, one of, one of my guiding verses is um, where Jesus said, I'm sending you out like sheep among wolves. Therefore, be as wise as serpents, but innocent as doves. And as believers, we're more comfortable talking about the innocence part. Oh, of course, we want to be innocent. We want to have pure motive. And that's critically important. But he's also saying be shrewd. And so how do, you, how do you work through these issues that we deal with that are very complicated and where there are all kinds of other forces at work? And how do you, how do you be shrewd? And I think the, there's very rarely going to be the one answer. But I believe that if you, li if you pray and listen, you know, pray without ceasing, that the Holy Spirit will, wants to speak into our lives and guide us in these little decisions that seem mundane, whether it's about an appropriations bill, an amendment, and... Um, and really try to listen. And, and I also want to encourage you guys to, if, if there's a couple of things you read about politics and faith, one of the best ever is uh, C.S. Lewis's essay called The Inner Ring. And it's a, it's a meditation on power. And uh, uh, it describes the story of there's, there are two people talking to a king and a ruler. One, one has the better resume. The other has the relationship with the ruler and who has more of the servant's heart. And a couple of great lines in that is C.S. Lewis says that pers the pursuit of the inner ring is like peeling an onion. You keep peeling until there's nothing left. And this pursuit of power makes very good people do very bad things. So a lot of what we deal with in the day-to-day -day is dealing with all the ugliness and mess of those mixed motivations and really knowing how to proceed and how to relate to people is a matter of being in constant co communication with God and other people in the context of relationship. 
who can help navigate very nitty gritty tough tough issues. Um, just to briefly add to what's already been said, um, and this somewhat goes back to the earlier question, in, in my experience, I don't know if it's been different for um, John and Catherine, but I haven't had as many mentors along the way as I have had peers that have kind of encouraged me in my walk, and I think some of that is um, that the Hill in particular is a very young place. Um, you know, there's a lot of, uh, you have your chiefs of staff, but then there's a lot of basically 22 to, you know, 32 year olds. Um, so there's, there's not necessarily um, a lot of wisdom in terms of additional years lived to um, tap into. And for those that have been here for a long time, especially as for, for women, they tend to be either, you know, eager to get out of work as quickly as possible to get back to their kids, or they're not necessarily as available to, um, to kind of serve in those mentoring roles. And so being open to just receiving wisdom from all manner of different um, sources, whether it's community, a Bible study, and, and off, you know, outside of the political realm. I'm in a weekly women's group where one of the women kind of works in this sphere and at a, at a think tank, but um, the other is a stay-at-home mom, the other is a nurse, and just kind of giving yourself, there, there are a lot of people that work in Washington and live in Washington that aren't involved in politics and have, you know, deep spiritual walks and very valid things to offer, and um, so not necessarily expecting that kind of you're going to always be most spiritually fed by someone else that's in the exact same, you know, sphere that you're living and operating in. Um, and I've also, you know, I guess observed that in almost every Hill office, <laughs> there's one other Christian. And I don't know if that's a divine, you know, uh, kind of God ordained. Uh, um, it's, it's, and it's not necessarily what you would think. It's not kind of the Bible Belt offices have a, a lot of really active Christians and then the, you know, Pacific Northwest or something does it. I mean, it's, it's, it's different than that. And so just um, being open to uh, where you might find other believers, whether it's in a Democrat office or Republican office. Um, you know, some of you may know Meredith Schultz, who is now at AEI, but was a former coworker of mine in Congressman Wolf's office and um, is herself a believer. And oftentimes, I think we would encourage each other in our walks, but it didn't necessarily look like, you know, how are we going to handle this political policy issue? It was going for a walk and grabbing a cup of coffee and talking about what's going on in life and just kind of being a friend. And so it doesn't look that different than what it looks like in college. You're just in a different, um, in a different sphere. I think we are at oh, one more. Josh is giving us extra time. Thank you, Josh. Wow, okay. Uh, Jennifer Walsh, Azusa Pacific University. I was wondering if you could just briefly touch on um, how you navigate the tension between the um, Christian emphasis on unity of believers and the partisanship that is existing on the Hill. I'll start that. Um, well, I would say, in, one, in a sentence, I would say, attack, attack the idea, not the individual. And here's, here's the story. Um, so Dr. Coburn came to me at the end of the year last year, was furious at the Obama administration about the decline of the rule of law. And, and we were able to have a conversation about, well, how do we write this in a way that blesses your relationship with them? So we can talk at that level. And so I, I said, you know, the problem is, is worse than the rule of law. It's that we don't, we've completely lost focus on what truth means. So we had this dialogue back and forth and ended up writing something that was very critical of the Obama administration. We didn't pull any punches. We didn't water down in any way what he felt like was the right thing to do. So we put it out, the Wall Street Journal ran it. And then a month, six weeks later, at the National Prayer Breakfast, President Obama singles out Tom Coburn as his friend and asks people to pray for him. And that, to me, shows how you can actually do that. You can be very critical, you can attack ideas without belittling another human being. And that's, and I'm, so I'm blessed because I have a boss who has the wisdom to see that. I, I'm able to serve him and help him do that. He understands how to do it better than I do. Um, 
But that the he is a great example of how to attack ideas, but not people. Yeah, it's hard to top that. Yeah. Um, so I think uh, we're at the end of our time for this panel. Um, if you could please thank our panelists, Sarah. Thank you. Thank you.